Um, Dr. Uh, your schedule says Dr. Anush Okade, but Anush had a, uh, a mishap last night playing ball with his son, got a baseball in the eye, and uh, I don't think it didn't sound too bad, but he didn't feel like he should be up here uh, standing like a pirate. So uh, he's uh, decided to turn over his task to uh, uh, his colleague, Dr. Rustus O'Brien. Rustus, uh, I know well because he's one of the uh, anesthesia critical care uh, intensivists here at uh, UC San Diego and uh, Arrestus um, um, has uh, a distinguished record both in academics and in also in clinical and he's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, difficult airways uh, in the trauma patients so uh, thanks very much Arrestus. Good morning. I'm sorry to disappoint people who were hoping that I knew should show up, but I'll try and uh, do the best I can. Today, we're going to talk about um, really the uh, uh, impact of the difficult airway algorithm specific for trauma, emergency medicine, and ICU, particularly how to think about and manage um, acute airway difficulties and potential acute airway difficulties. And I got to try and divide this into two uh, broad based principles. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the algorithm, some uh, sort of underlying ideas of uh, uh, the algorithm itself, which is really written and intended to be applied to um, uh, airway management in the operating room, and then modify that quickly for the emergency and ICU settings. And then we'll talk a bit about um, the airway exam, which turns out to be, I think, more important than people often recognize. Um, oxygenation, optimal conditions for rigid direct laryngoscopy, and then um, how to think about cannot intubate, cannot ventilate situations. Um, and then also I'll talk about, um, so really this, these problems associated with difficult intubations uh, yielding difficult extubations. Uh, I hope to do that reasonably uh, quickly and then get to some specific scenarios so that people can walk away with something concrete that they can um, uh, hold on to, I hope. Uh, the difficult airway algorithm is published about every seven to ten years by the ASA. The last one was in 2013. And the main sort of gist of the changes from the prior airway algorithms were that they embraced the concept of superglottic airways, particularly laryngeal mask airways, but really any superglottic airway, as a rescue device and also as a device that can be a conduit towards establishing a more permanent airway. And the other I issue that the uh, ASA um, added into the algorithm was that the uh, video-assisted laryngoscopy um, could be uh, included in uh, protocols as well as in your thinking for how to manage a difficult airway. And we'll talk a little bit about the details of when you should think about a video-assisted laryngoscopy. The main sort of cognitive actions, which I, I think are important and worth thinking about, are how to think about airway management problems as they present themselves to you, is to ask yourself a series of sort of questions. Um, will the patient be able to cooperate or not? Right? And in the emergency room, in the ICU, and in the trauma, on the trauma bay, that is variable. Um, will, do you anticipate that the patient will be difficult to mask um, by an external mask ventilation? Do, do you think that it'll be possible to place a superglottic airway in the patient um, if other means don't fail, or even as an initial me method of uh, 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 ensuring uh, oxygenation and ventilation? Do you think the patient will be difficult to innovate? Do you think the patient will be difficult to establish a, a reasonable view? And do you think the patient will have a difficult surgical airway access? Because the difference between the algorithm from 2000, the, the algorithm written for the operating room, the algorithm written for the uh, ICU and the uh, emergency department and, and the trauma bay is that you can't sort of back out. There's no kind of like, oh, let's wake this patient up and do the surgery another day. Um, the, uh, the three other cognitive uh, areas that they talk about are, do you have the ability to continuously deliver supplemental oxygen, which uh, now there's pretty good evidence, improves uh, outcomes even from airways that deteriorate into um, you know, much more emergent situations. You should consider certain things when you are either uh, establishing an airway yourself or assisting other one, another person who's establishing an airway, is should you do this air innovation awake or should you keep the patient asleep? Um, is there any benefit to non-invasive techniques to intubation? Again, should you consider a video lar laryngoscope and when should you consider it? And should you uh, obliterate spontaneous ventilation or should you allow the patient to ventilate spontaneously? And there's two limbs that we think about. Uh, one is the awake limb and the um, uh, sort of a sleep limb, we call it, but that's really the limb of intubation after induction of general anesthesia. Um, the, um, the, the algorithm as written for the OR, as you'll notice, I don't know if there's a pointer on the page, right? has these wake up the patient areas. I can't really 
I can't really point to them. But there's cancel the case. And so the difficulty with this is that none of those actually exist in the real world of the, um, of the trauma bay in the, in the emergency department. Um, but this is the general form of what you should do, which is consider awake versus asleep intubations and go through a series of steps if whatever you tried to do last has failed. And we'll go into much more detail about this. But I do want to get to some principles. And this is that something I think we all learned whatever, uh, many, many moons ago, which is that airway, breathing, and circulation are the foundation of resuscitation in patients who present, um, who require resuscitation. Um, the modifications to that have come somewhat in the resuscitation literature, which suggests that the airway doesn't have to necessarily be an endotracheal tube, but there does need to be a patent uh, exchange of gas to maintain oxygenation. Um, uh, and circulation could be anything from, uh, you know, a patient getting chest compressions to a patient being placed on acne. Let's talk about rapid sequence induction, just so people know what it is and what we're doing. Uh, it's really a series of steps, and it's uh, well described. It involves pre-oxygenation, the application of cricoid pressure over the cricothyroid uh, cartilage to uh, uh, compress the esophagus and allow, um, and, and hopefully prevent uh, aspiration of gastric contents, administration of an induction drug and a neuromuscular blocking drug, um, and uh, a bag mass ventilation generally is avoided prior to endotracheal intubation because of the area, because of the worries about in increasing intergastric pressure and increasing the risk of uh, aspiration. This is the rationale. This is a, a chest film from a patient who uh, aspirated uh, just post induction or prior to induction. Um, and this has been well described in the literature. Um, and it does, uh, and aspiration is known to, and the risk of aspiration is known to increase with a full stomach as well as um, uh, in other circumstances acid reflux disease, obesity, but mainly following trauma, your risk of aspiration is higher than it is um, in patients who come to the OR electively. But that's not the only consideration in the trauma bay or in the ICU. There are other considerations. Um, hypovolemia and, its, uh, and hypotension are very common presenting symptoms. Um, uh, there are considerations for the cervical spine, the maximal facial injuries. There are common in contraindications to uh, rapid sequence induction, particularly known difficult airway. That is to say you anticipate that it'll be difficult to establish the airway efficiently or uh, swelling neck uh, injury and strider. So it's important to remember that the full stomach considerations should be taken into account, but they don't obliterate the considerations for a um, emergent deterioration of your ability to establish an airway. So cannot intubate, cannot ventilate situations uh, subsume those of uh, aspiration precautions. Okay, so this is more of the algorithm for emergency situations. And I try, I, I, I try to keep it as simple as possible. Again, one assess the difficulty of all the things we're interested in, which is ventilating out by mask, establishing an intracheal airway, uh, placing a, um, air, uh, a tracheostomy or a cricothyroidotomy, um, and um, whether or not that patient can actually consent to some things that may allow you to eliminate risks. Particularly if they're awake and cooperative, you can do things that don't require you to induce anesthesia in them. Um, you want to try really hard to deliver oxygen throughout the, the course of your uh, airway management, and you want to decide, am I going to do this awake or asleep? Am I going to use uh, an endotracheal tube, or am I going to do cri cricothyroidotomy or tracheostomy? Am I going to use a, a video scope? Am I going to do months, maintain spontaneous ventilation or obliterate ventilation? And am I going to do a rapid sequence induction, or am I going to modify that rapid sequence induction maybe to ventilate through that cricoid pressure just to maintain um, uh, alveolar gas exchange? You really want to, if you are managing an airway or helping someone manage an airway, you want to come up with a plan A and a plan B, right? Because you never want to be thinking about those plans when plan A fails. Um, you want to uh, consider uh, what, you, what other options you might have if you have difficulty ventilating. Uh, Superglottic airways have proven very successful in patients who were difficult to ventilate. But the main thing is that none of these stopping options exist, and you have to remember that. So part of the airway algorithm doesn't exist for you in the trauma bay. You want to confirm an integral tube placement. More uh, uh, patients can appear to be ventilating adequately when they have uh, an, an interesophageal intubations. Um, and you want to remember that difficult intubations and uh, yield difficult extubations. So you have to have a plan in your head for how you're going to get this guy extubated uh, if you found yourself having difficulty. This is uh, Benamoff's detailed assessment of how to manage, uh, how to assess an airway. Um, and it's 11 steps and it's very long. The much more rational way to do it in, in an in a emergent situation is, I think, to look at a shorter approach that is, I think, memorizable by everyone and easy to understand. One is look at the general anatomy. This person, just looking at that person, would be difficult to crike. 
probably difficult to intubate. You can see that they um, are morbidly obese. You can barely make out any neck anatomy. That would mean that if, you, if one of your algorithm options was to crack this guy, this would be much more difficult then. Mouth opening is extremely important. Um, uh, you want to look for how much a patient can open their mouth. Obviously, mandibular fractures and, uh, air and facial trauma and neck trauma can affect that substantially. There are three uh, distances that have been demonstrated to predict difficult, air, difficult intubations. One is the intra-incisor distance. That is the dis distance between the incisors. Is it greater than three um, uh, finger breaths? The thiomental or hyomental distance is the length of the mandible and how um, caught at the, the, the hyoid bone sits. A more caught at hyoid bone is a little difficult to get down because it's more posterior. So you want to say, is this a very long hy hy hyoid bone? Um, and then the, and the distance um, can predict how difficult it's going to be to innovate the trachea. Uh, the malampati class also predicts, and it's also worth memorizing that malampati classes one and two tend to be associated with easier uh, endotracheal intubations, whereas three and four tend to be um, much more difficult. So it's worth, if, to, if the patient's able to open their mouth, trying to es estimate what their malampati class is, and then look for airway obstruction. Um, if you have uh, significant airway obstruction, getting an intracheal tube past that is going to be a lot harder. And then real, something that's often overlooked is neck mobility. Um, the patient who is in a halo or a patient who's had severe burn in the upper chest and the neck may have a much less compliant uh, anterior space. And what endotracheal intubation is, is basically deploying the contents of the larynx into that anterior space and getting a conduit between uh, the mouth and the airway. Um, and then you want to ask practical questions. Patients with severe facial trauma will be much more difficult to ventilate, and you think about going immediately to uh, either cricothyroidotomy or tracheostomy in this patient. Um, morbid obesity will have effects on oxygenation, which I think are worth understanding, although not worth really memorizing, so I'll spend just a short period of time on this slide. Um, this is a slide which really talks about the importance of pre-oxygenation, and I think it cannot be emphasized. This is just a... a, um, uh, a characterization of tidal volume ventilation, which, so these are sort of tidal volume breaths, which includes then a vital capacity breath, which is maximum inhalation and maximum exhalation. And beyond that, all you have as an oxygen reserve is your uh, residual volume. Um, and it turns out that at 100% FiO2, if you're uh, uh, pre-oxygenating 100% FiO2, you get about 10 minutes until you desaturate. Um, whereas if you're breathing room air, you get about two minutes until you desaturate. So there's a tremendous benefit to pre-oxygenation. And this is also demonstrated that this critical hemoglobin desaturation um, really starts um, and, and is affected by your, fun your uh, functional residual capacity and your residual volume. So obese patients, so an obese adult, will start to see significant reductions in their uh, oxygen saturation, say down to below 90% at two and a half or so minutes, whereas a normal 70 kilogram adult will have a much longer period of time. Pre-oxygenation improves, um, improves the duration of time you have to try and establish an airway, which can be crucial to avoiding an organ dysfunction and even death in patients um, you have to intubate and ventilate. Um, patients with difficult airways need maximum pre-oxygenation because it's going to take longer. Patients who have uh, oxygen delivery abnormalities um, will need uh, the maximum pre-oxygenation. Um, and the way you can estimate the oxygen delivery is the O2 content. Uh, it's using the, the, the thick result for content, which is the hemoglobin concentration, the saturation of, he, of uh, oxygen on that hemoglobin times the fudge factor. The amount of solubilized oxygen in the peripheral blood is pretty trivial. Um, so this is all multiplied by cardiac output. So it, it, these O2 delivery abnormalities can mean a patient who's, who's presenting an arrest or a patient who's uh, um, cardiac output. And the hemoglobin concentration obviously um, varies. It's important to, I think, at least think of what causes hypoxemia, because you'll face it in the trauma room and, and, in, and in the ICU. Um, in broad strokes, uh, reduced partial pressure of oxygen in the, in the inspired air, so increase the FiO2 can maybe help with that. Uh, alveolar hypoventilation, so improving uh, alveolar, alveolar ventilation by delivering oxygen uh, more effectively to the alveolar space, making sure that your oxygen is getting there. Uh, mismatch of ventilation and perfusion is, can be difficult to, to, to correct, but sometimes can be corrected with higher FiO2s or additional expiratory pressures. Shunt you can't do very much about, um, and um, in, impaired alveolar capillary diffusion, at least acutely, is not very fixable. This is, uh, again, demonstrating the importance of body mass index. In a normal 70-kilogram person, you'll see a, a acute desaturation um, approaching 10 minutes. 
um, depending on the uh, A, this is capital F, capital A O2, so that's the alveolar concentration of oxygen, which is uh, presumed to be roughly the same as the inspired concentration of oxygen. Whereas in patients who have much higher body mass indexes, it's much shorter. So it's important to think of those things when you're thinking about what strategies you're going to use to establish an airway. How do you do it practically? Give someone a continuously held mask on their face for three to five minutes, have a reservoir bag which demonstrates uh, tidal breathing, and make sure that they inhale um, and exhale, and you track that exhalation with capnography. So there has been, and I'll mention this in briefly, some uh, controversy about whether or not long-term pre-oxygenation is effective. Uh, this is data from two, comparing two different methods of pre-oxygenation. One is uh, a sort of deep, uh, deep breathing four times over 30 seconds versus the traditional five to three minutes of pre-oxygenation. And what you see in, in this sort of a compendium of three studies is that there's not much of a difference in uh, arterial PO2 after either of these two methods. So if you just say to someone, hey, take four big deep breaths for me, you'll actually achieve a PaO2 that roughly approximates the same PaO2 you would achieve if you asked them to pre-oxygenate and breathe 100% FiO2 well for five minutes. But that said, if you look at the time to desaturation, again, another, a series of studies performed mostly in the 90s and early 2000s, that the Time to desaturation is much, much shorter in the patients that only did the 30 sec uh, four breaths deep over 30 seconds. And what this suggests is that you can achieve an adequate PaO2 with four deep breaths. What you can't do is you can't enrich the venous blood and the, and the venous reservoirs with oxygen. And that is what you depend on when you are unable to establish an airway over a period of time. So again, I don't recommend that, particularly in the trauma room. Okay. Let's go on to pre-oxygenation um, and into sort of your best attempt at rigid direct laryngoscopy. Uh, I, in emergency situations, the most experienced person is probably the best person to try. Um, you want to have optimal uh, neuromuscular blockade. Uh, succinylcholine is a drug that's you know, on its way out. Um, and it's now, because rocuronium, as you know, can be antagonized by um, antibodies uh, in, and have been, been approved for Sugamidex, we hardly ever use sucks at all anymore. Um, but either way, the establishment of adequate neuromuscular blockade improves your chances of first pass success. Um, you want to try and establish a sniffing position in patients for whom it is appropriate. Patients with cervical neck issues, you don't want to be extending the mandible um, and extending the neck. So in, the, in patients who are appropriate, but you can remove a, um, a Philadelphia collar in those patients. Um, you want to do um, uh, appropriate cricoid pressure and um, extra laryngeal manipulation so you can try and get the best view of the glottis you can. And you get sort of two or three opportunities to try and change blades, change blade lengths. Um, and I recommend using a styletted endotracheal tube where you can control the tip of the, of the endotracheal tube. In this circumstance, you have your best chance of establishing an airway, uh, establishing an airway by direct laryngoscopy. But there are circumstances in which you cannot intubate or cannot ventilate. What things can help you in that circumstance? One is a, a supraglottic airway, particularly an LMA, or uh, a, what's called a combi tube, but any airway that may be able to ventilate from above. You can also use something called transtracheal jet ventilation. Now that has to be available, but I believe that is available at least in, in the emergency department uh, in La Jolla, in which at high pressure you can place, I think I have a picture of it. Uh, no. Uh, at high pressure, you can place a, uh, a needle into the, uh, through the cricothyroid membrane and ventilate that way. Um, this can save patients for whom you were unable to establish an airway. Uh, rigid direct laryngoscopy obviously is a, a, an opportunity, is a possible um, alternative in um, patients for whom you're having difficulty inhaling and ventilating. And a surgical airway has to be very much always considered in the trauma room of the ICU. We, we go to surgical airway much earlier and much more often in emergency situations than we ever do in the operating room. LMAs, uh, I'm guessing by now most people are very familiar with them. Supergotic areas have been around since the early 90s. Uh, they're very effective. Um, they uh, have been included in the algorithm and have been documented to improve survival in patients who were in a DNI, um, cannot intubate, cannot ventilate situation. Uh, flexible bronchoscopy can be placed through an LMA. This is a, um, a, a uh, LMA that has um, a port for which you can place through a, a flexible bronch. You can see this on the, on the dummy that this red area right here it holds a, a bronch. You can look down and you often will get a view that looks like that, um, which is very reassuring. Then you can remove this red, uh, red cap right here and you can pass an endotracheal tube through the same hole. 
and often are able to establish an airway through an LMA. So if you place an LMA, you have not given up the opportunity to establish a more permanent airway. Okay. Good, details, details. Um, they're, the ones that we use here are the cook gas, and they really accommodate large endotracheal tubes. So the 4.5 takes an 8.0 tube, and the 3.5 takes a 7.0 endotracheal tube. Uh, Transtracheal jet ventilation, this is what I was looking for earlier. Uh, very effective technique. It has, it has some risks because you're going to ventilate at something in the neighborhood of 25 to 30 PSI. So you will be introducing higher pressures into the neck, but you oxygenate. And when you're in circumstances where you're having difficulty oxygenating, being able to oxygenate can save organs and save lives. You enter the cricothyroid membrane at roughly 30 degrees, deploy a, a, a stylet, pulling out a, a, deploy a, a cannula, pulling out a stylet, attach that to a jet, tracheal jet ventilator, and you can give uh, sort of puff breaths to the ventilator. You obviously have to have that whole setup established in your uh, trauma bay, your emergency department, your ICU, but um, it can really be a life-saving procedure and um, that has been well documented. All right, let's talk about video laryngoscopes because that's probably the newest and most exciting uh, aspect of laryngoscopy. They have evolved over the past 10 or so years and people are now using video laryngoscopes as their first line for all intubations. I think it's important to remember what they're good at and what they're not good at. So video laryngoscopes are great for patients who have anteriorly displaced larynxes because they have this very sharp curve and they can see around the corner. So establishing a good view with a video laryngoscope tends to be fairly easy. What is much more difficult is, is passing the endotracheal tube through a very uh, anteriorly displaced larynx. Now these come with these very, these very curved stylets, so, which make it better and easier to do, but not 100%. And in fact, all of the studies that looked at experienced practitioners using either a video laryngoscope when compared to a ordinary direct laryngoscope found that the direct laryngoscope was faster and better, even in anteriorly displaced nerves. So someone might reject your suggestion of a video laryngoscope on the grounds that they are more comfortable using a direct laryngoscope. And video laryngoscopes don't do much for you when you have other problems like blood, uh, obstruction in the airway. So they're not much, they're worse than a direct laryngoscope. So it has its uses and it's very popular, but it has its limitations and you can use it very well if you know what those limit limitations are. You get a pretty view and you can often pass an intracheal tube through that view. Um, the, um, keep going here. The, the really important thing to remember, and this is where a lot of intraoperative morbidity and mortality comes from, is recognition of extra tracheal intubations. Okay? People must recognize extra tracheal intubations. The most effective and reliable way to do that is to use end tidal CO2, but also other means. This obviously is an endotracheal tube that is outside the trachea um, and is, should not give you a reliable end tidal CO2 tracing. Um, you can sometimes get entitled CO2 for the first two or three breaths, but after that, you should start to really lose it. And that should make you very aware that you have not yet established an airway successfully. The cheapest and easiest way to, to do it is with this um, CO2 detector. It should turn yellow every time they exhale because it has a color, colorimetric change. Um, and so uh, once you've now established an airway, the thing you have to remember is if you had a hard time getting an airway in, there's so, the, the person who's going to take that airway out, who often is a different person, may, needs to remember that they will be, should be cautioned to be careful about extubation. Um, di difficult intubations and extubations are associated with difficult tube changes. Um, the, um, the Things that you can use to try and improve your chances of successful extubation are a uh, fiber optic bronchoscope, which you can pass outside the endotracheal tube to look for swelling in the airway, which may have gone in there as a result of trauma or a result of your intubation. You can use video laryngoscope and under direct vision, try and remove the airway and see if it collapses. Sometimes that works. Um, and you can use combination techniques. The stylet that um, is uh, used very often in, in uh, extubations in patients who were difficult to intubate is an airway exchange catheter. It's a very nice device and I think it's really worth getting familiar with. You can ventilate through it, you can oxygenate through it, you can um, measure end tidal CO2 and it functions as a reintubation stylet. So you can place it through an endotracheal tube, remove that endotracheal tube, and if you did it all wrong and the whole thing collapses on you, if there's, if there's, uh, there's uh, lots of stuff that makes you regret it, you can often repass the endotracheal tube through that. So. Um, that's sort of general principles about the application of airway techniques to the uh, trauma and emergency intubations. I'd like to cover some specifics. Um, if I have time. Um, so uh, let's just talk about a 35-year-old male who got assaulted, has a dilated right pupil, has a GCS of five, and an obvious uh, traumatic brain injury, and has a known difficult airway. So when you ask yourself the question, what are the general considerations for establishing an airway on this guy? For example, can I do an awake endotracheal intubation? What drives your decision making? Because airway management, in fact, is all about a series of decisions. 
right? Some of which you regret, some of which you don't. But you try to create an opportunity for yourself to back out of those decisions if they turned out to be the wrong one. Um, so does GCS matter? Does hemodynamic stability matter? And how about patient cooperation? Let's talk about general considerations. He's got a known difficult airway. In that circumstance, you tend to migrate towards awake endotracheal intubation, provided that he's cooperative and stable hemodynamically. He can maintain spontaneous ventilation and that his Glasgow coma score is nine or better. Now, in a patient with obvious TBI, uh, recommendations of the Glasgow coma score be really close to 14, greater than 14, um, before you uh, consider awake intubations. So this patient had a Glasgow Coma Scale 5. So awake intubation is unlikely to be successful. He's not awake, he's not cooperative. This is a patient in whom you are likely to have to um, put him to sleep prior to induction. Now, if he's got a Glasgow Coma Scale 5, you may not have to use much to put him to sleep, but you, that arm of the algorithm is off the table and won't work. He won't cooperate, you won't be able to do anything that way. So what do you do? Um, uh, how do you modify it for traumatic brain injury? You said a G, they divide the algorithm into GCS greater than nine or less than nine or, 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 and into recognized difficult airway. And in either of those circumstances, even with a GCS greater than nine and a recognized difficult airway, they recommend an awake technique. But if your patient is uncooperative, then it's a modified rapid sequence induction um, and ordinary propofol, some kind of neuromuscular blockade, and try to establish a tube. Try to keep the patient's cerebral perfusion pressure, which is the difference between the mean arterial pressure and their ICP, which you may not know at the time you're intubating, as high as you can, meaning you try to keep their mean arterial pressure high, and you try not to, um, reduce, uh, to, try not to increase their ICP if you can help it. Things that do that tend to be hypercapnia and hypoxemia, so you try to avoid both of those. So your thought about continuous oxygen um, delivery is important, and you um, try to think of drugs that in, uh, enhance that strategy. The, um, the uh, most important drug in TBI for uh, sleep innovations is Tomidate. Uh, it has a number of very positive effects. It lowers the ICP. It tends to reduce uh, cerebral metabolic oxygen rate, um, and it decreases cerebral blood flow, all good things. It also has a very modest effect on the mean arterial pressure and the wedge pressure uh, and the filling pressures in the heart. It tends not to affect uh, cardiac index very much and has not major effects on the um, on the stroke volume, but it does have one really bad side effect that you have to consider, which is that it blocks 11-beta-hydroxylase and is a suppressor of adrenal um, uh, steroid synthesis. So in a patient who's septic, who potentially may depend on adrenal steroid synthesis, you have to consider that. Now there have been a host of studies over the last two years, mostly in chronically ill uh, uh, ICU patients, that don't suggest that um, uh, uh, even a, a single dose of atominate makes much of a difference. But you do have to know that if you have a patient who has, uh, on whom you expect they'll depend on their, their adrenal steroids, that you will, you are suppressing that at least for a period of time. There are people working on change, uh, modifications of, of atominate to reduce the steroid suppressive effect. So that may, this may, consideration may be taken care of. Let's talk about a patient who's a 27 year old female, had a body serving accident, has neck pain and some weak lower extremities. What are basic C-spine considerations in managing an airway? If it's difficult, should you do it awake? Can you use a video laryngoscope? Is this appropriate time for fiber optic? What key questions do you have? Does the rest of the airway exam have any validity if you can't move the neck? Does the patient neurologic status per, uh, affect their, your choices about what you're gonna do with their airway? Are they cooperative but have neck injury? Can you treat them as a patient who's cooperative? And what about their hemodynamics? If they have a C-spine injury, their hemodynamics may be unstable. Here we consider several things. Um, to do an awake intubation, you can do it, provided all the things you need to do an awake intubation are there, which is cooperative, stable patient who can breathe spontaneously. You now have a presumed uh, C-spine injury, so it's gonna be crucial that, that you don't exacerbate or uh, 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 extend the neck. Can you do your awake intubation in those circumstances? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, all of the predictors of difficult airway still exist. If you have a difficult airway, probably the awake, awake technique, if she were cooperative and breathing spontaneously, would be the best choice here. You would get a fiber optic bronchoscope and you would try to establish an airway using a fiber. And this, again, is the same sort of thing we talked about with the other uh, circumstances. Um, a difficult uh, intubation uh, known uh, 
versus even if you anticipate an easy intubation, if you have neuro deficits, we tend to suggest that you do an awake technique, which is either fiber optic or a retrograde. Uh, I'm not sure I'd do a blind nasal, but um, an uncooperative, unstable patient ob obliterates that arm. You have to do a modified rapid sequence induction with inline mobilization of the neck so that you try not to uh, exacerbate cervical spine injury. All right, we'll do this as the last one. 36-year-old uh, female after a, a, a car accident, car versus pole in a tunnel. Um, multiple injuries, including a left chest injury, left-sided rib fractures. There's some extra anatomic air on the left on the film, but no major pneumothorax or hemothorax. Uh, patient may have a partial airway disruption on the left is what you worry about. So what do you consider? Airway disruptions are um, uh, not on, are, have been reported in blunt trauma, not infrequently. Most of them happen at around the level of the carina, although there are some that are above and a small number that are uh, uh, down at the level of the um, bronchus. Um, if you have a patient with a known difficult airway who has a known or potential airway disruption, you have a risk of a major laryngeal tear. What would you do in that circumstance? Again, it would depend on some of these questions you ask. Are they awake? Can they breathe spontaneously? Are they hemodynamically stable? And are they cooperative? Um, if they are cooperative and they are hemodynamically stable, you might consider awake intubation using a fiber optic bronchoscope and try and displace your endotracheal tube past the lesion if you can identify it. Major laryng laryngeal uh, or uh, tracheobronchial tear, an awake technique is, is uh, recommended, except in the circumstance where the patient is non-cooperative or unstable. Then you have to do a modified uh, RSA um, and general anesthesia. If you have a very small tear, or uh, it's probably okay to do a modified uh, general anesthetic prior to uh, induction, prior to intubation, but you have to be careful with that. Most people, I think, would probably do an awake technique in the circumstances. If you're unable to maintain spontaneous ventilation, here you have to ask yourself, should I simply go to a surgical airway right away? In this circumstance where you have a, a, a tracheal disruption, an awake technique can work, but many people would say, let's just establish either a, a, a trachea or a cricothyroid. You can do conventional oratracheal intubation, but that's, uh, you are accepting that you are now delivering an intracheal tube blindly into a space that you know is disrupted. Um, and the one thing I think really to remember is that tra transtracheal jet ventilation, which is very effective in hypoxic situations, shouldn't be used when you, do, when you have uh, a, um, a, a, a lesion distal to the, to the jet. Uh, Superglottic airways tend to be ineffective because you have a disrupted, uh, a disrupted tracheobronchial tree. And, um, you may ask yourself, is this a time to consider a double lumen endotracheal tube to isolate your ventilation or um, think about going on bypass or uh, ECMO? I think that's all the time I have. I can entertain questions if anybody has specific questions about the decision tree for, tra for trauma innovation. Great, thanks very much.